Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. We're reading verses 6 to 10. Jeanne, let's start with you, please. To the, to the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath me, or the earth beneath buried me in forever. But you brought my life up in the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered your word, and my prayer rose to you to your holy temple. Ten. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited the former upon that day. So we've been looking at Jonah and how much of what he's been praying in this chapter is based upon many psalms and some other concepts or contexts throughout the Old Testament. And it's no different as we continue in these verses, verses 6 to 9, because verse 10 is no longer the prayer. The prayer ends in verse 9. But he says that he went down. Uh, so remember the, uh, the slide that we had looking out. He went down to Joppa, down into the boat, and so on and so forth. Continues here speaking about going down. The earth with its bars were behind me or closed behind me forever. We've been looking at the parallel between Jonah and Jesus. And we see yet another parallel taking place here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. And we're going to look at verses 59 and 60. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. And of course we have a, a parallel accounts of this where um, Nicodemus is helping him as well, and they're wrapping Jesus' body, and they are anointing or preparing his body with spices as well that would be wrapped in between the folds of this burial cloth. Seventy-five pounds that they would be wrapping him in. And so we get this picture once again where um, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. It's a picture of the grave. You're not coming out again. At least the anticipation is that, right? But we see that with Jonah, that he's not going to be kept in the, the grave, as it were, nor is Jesus going to be kept in the grave. I want to have a look at uh, Psalm 103 and verse 4 in reference to this idea of the pit, where he prays, you have brought up my life from the pit. Psalm 103 and verse 4. And we are at Louise. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies.
Um, I wrote down the wrong one. Uh, NIV says redeemed your lifetime. Yeah. Oh, okay, yes, thank you. All right, so redeems, he redeems your life from the pit. Um, so where it speaks of destruction, he redeems your life from destruction, is redeeming your life from the pit. And that's this idea where he says that you have brought my life up from the pit, up from the point of destruction, catastrophe, uh, that which was going to be a devastation to his life. He, he just, that was going to be the end as far as, as he was concerned. But God comes in, and he brings him up. And only God can do this. It's not something that he could do by his own determination or his own strength. And here he, notice how he refers to God. The last phrase in verse 6. Now remember, anytime I, I speak of a chapter or a verse, it's, Jonah. I'm not, all right? So if I just speak of the chapter or verse, it's Jonah. Um, otherwise, I'll speak the book and the reference that we're in. So back in verse 6, notice how he addresses God. He says, O oh Lord, my God. Once again, it's like he, he recognizes there's a restoration, if you will, of his standing with God. He's been restored to that place of standing. He's spoken about it already about um, verse 4 where I'll look again to your holy temple because it's in his temple that his presence is represented. But his presence is not confined to the temple. And he knows this. So it, it's unlike... King Saul, for instance. When Saul sinned and Samuel was rebuking him, and then he said, would you pray to the Lord your God, not the Lord my God or the Lord our God? Because so far as Saul is concerned, he's basically done this to the Lord. And, and God is there as a point of convenience. Do you remember when we were looking at, uh, at Saul in con contrast to David in our last study through eyes, with eyes of faith? And we saw that uh, with Saul, he was a king that was the, uh, that which the people wanted. It was, he was according to the people's choice. Now, the people didn't go out and say, okay, we want Saul. It says elsewhere that the Lord chose Saul, but he chose Saul in reference to the desires of the people's hearts. And Saul was a manifestation, if you will. He was a representation of the heart of mankind. The heart wants what the heart wants, right? And the heart will go by its own strength. The heart will follow itself. The heart doesn't want to follow anything or anyone else. This is what Saul was. And so he would say uh, things like, would you pray to the Lord your God on my behalf? Here we see that Jonah's heart is still towards the Lord because he, he refers to God in the personal first person sense. Oh Lord, my God. Because he recognizes that this is a relationship of grace. He's only where he is because of the grace of God. And he knows this full well. He knows it long before he goes in to the fish. He knows it back in chapter 1 when God calls to him. Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh and preach to them. It says that he got up and he ran from the presence of the Lord. And why did he do that? We looked at it already. We're going to see it again when we come to chapter 4. But do you remember why he ran away from the presence of the Lord? Because of God's mercy. It, it, uh, so... Was he afraid of God's mercy? What, what was the context? What about God's mercy? He, he didn't see any point 
go and preach it to the Ninevites when God is going to show his mercy and they're all going to be good. Yeah, he's like, no, I want, I want vengeance on them. They've done a lot of wicked stuff and they've invaded uh, other lands. They're barbarians. They've come against our land. And so, yeah, he didn't want them to experience the compassion, the mercy of God. So he knows full well about the mercy of God. And now here he is in a position of repentance and he's saying, uh, he's referring, oh Lord, my God, because that relationship now is restored once again. I want us to have a look here in verse, uh, verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered my, remember the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Let's go to Psalm 77. Psalm 77, we're going to look at verse 11 and 12. I will remember the deeds of the Lord, yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. All right, so when we see the psalmist here speaking about the Lord, he says, um, He's reminding himself about the things that God has done. And so how is he doing this? As, he's, as his prayer goes up to you, verse back in Jonah 7, 2 verse 7, my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Here in chapter 77 of Psalm, we see that uh, he's remembering the works of the Lord. And when Solomon uh, was dedicating the temple, do you remember what kind of things uh, that were being experienced by those that were gathered together that day? Fire came out from the presence of the Lord. Solomon had prayed a prayer and he said, Lord, uh, when your people, if they're scattered, if they've turned away from you and so on, we, and they call to you, they look to you, will you hear from heaven and forgive them? And the Lord says, responds to that, of course, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. And he speaks of this. Uh, in verse 12, still in Psalm 77, he says, I will meditate on all your work and, all, and talk of your deeds. And this is, in a sense, what, this, the psalm, or what uh, Jonah is doing. He's, he's speaking to himself of the works of the Lord, of his presence being exhibited, if you will, that he wasn't left to die, to drown in the sea. But he sends this fish, and he's reminding himself of the great things that God has done in the past. I wonder, I mean, he's had time to think, three days and three nights in the belly of this fish. And the, this, is, this is only a summary of what Jonah spoke in that, that fish. Uh, if, if you found yourself in a similar situation when you're praying, would you be, uh, would you just keep it to you know, a few verses, you know, a paragraph long, and that's all you've said for three days? Or that's all you've thought? This is a, a snapshot, if you will, of what was going on in Jonah's mind and specifically what is brought to us here that the Holy Spirit wants to highlight that. He doesn't leave us. His great and mighty deeds aren't just for people of the past. His presence wasn't just for those who deserved it, like a Moses or an Abraham. And of course, we know that they didn't have the presence of God because they deserved it. But we often think that way, don't we? Elijah, I mean, look what he did. He, he set himself apart and Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and these were men that were really devoted to God. So, of course, they deserved the presence of God, is what we tend to think. 
is the mindset we tend to have towards God's um, desire toward us. But God doesn't have his desire toward us or give us the experience of his presence because we deserve it. On the contrary, absolutely none of us deserve it. Not even Adam and Eve in their innocence did they deserve it. The only reason that they had God's presence is because God was merciful and compassionate, showed his love upon them. Did God need to show or demonstrate his presence to Adam in his unfallen state? So before he fell, did he need to show his presence to Adam and Eve? Did they deserve it? Were they in a deserving state? Is that a, are we thinking or <laughs> just don't, not sure? Do you think they deserved the presence of God? They were there and it was there. They, they always had the presence of God. But did they deserve it? Okay, but I'm, I, I realize none of us, but I, I just want to bring it back for a second and think about them before sin entered into their lives. They were innocent before they sinned in chapter 3. Did they deserve the presence of God before chapter 3? The moment God breathes into Adam's lungs, into his nostrils, and he became a living being, and he comes to life, is, oh, and he experiences relationship with God. Did he deserve it? So it's it was part of being sinless in a sense, but I want us to recognize that they didn't just have it because they were sinless. They experienced the presence of God by His mercy in the same way that they were created by His mercy and His love. That there's nothing... Think about uh, your children or grandchildren. Even uh, this little one that's in Caitlin's womb, yet unborn, not done a thing to deserve love from his or her mom and dad or grandparents, yet uh, when this baby comes into the world, out of that womb, there will be love, there will be warmth, there will be food, there will be clothing, there will be shelter, not because the baby deserves it, but because their mom and dad are showing love and mercy to this little one. It, it's sort of a, a picture, if you will, of, of the love of God for us who don't deserve it. Of course, sin came in and destroyed that. So I, I speak about that for, uh, to, to make us think about it for a minute so that we don't ever come to the point or, or fall into that place of thinking that other people deserve God's blessing or His mercy or His presence more than I do. Because mercy is mercy by virtue of the fact that a person does not Deserve it. That's what grace is. That's what mercy is. So my prayer goes up to you into your holy temple. I want to come look at, I want to really focus in here on verse 8 and 9. I mentioned last week uh, looking at different translations to see them the richness of the meaning of what's going on here in the Hebrew. Did anybody take the opportunity to have a look at the, the different focus, the different ways that this is stated? So what, what did you find as differences, as variations? So we compare or contrast different Words or or ideas in the different translations. What did you come up with? Mm 
Which verse is what? This is verse 8. Well, go ahead. Well, and at least those who cling to a disciple, the word cling is one thing, and then another group that says those who worship, and another one says those who pay regard. So we've got cling, worship. So there's some variations that are taking place there. Um, observing and regarding have, have a similar idea in the English, don't they? When you, when you observe something or you're giving regard to it, it's, it's your, well, I guess it depends on how you're looking at regard. I'm thinking of it in the, in the sense of looking. Um, so that's the sense of observing. But uh, if you regard something, you're giving attention to it, so it's not necessarily a looking, it's giving uh, your time or your focus or your energy to something in, the, in that regarding. Worship and clinging. So what did you see was in the, um, in the Hebrew? Did you come up with that? To watch, to keep, to preserve, to guard, to be careful. To hedge about. So to hedge about as with thorns. What in the world does that mean? Okay, anybody ever prayed that? Lord, I pray a hedge of protection around so-and-so, ourselves, the person traveling, uh, children, family members. What does that mean? Why a hedge of protection? Because Strong's translated like that, and the Strong's is popular, and it's like, you know, everyone's like, clinging on to that word. <laughs> okay, everyone's like, clinging on. What's a hedge? Greenery around your house. house. Gr greenery around your house. <laughs> you know what a hedge way, right, is? A hedge can also be rock. All right, so a hedge can also be rock. Yeah. But when we often think about hedge, hedgery or hedging, uh, we think of uh, shrubbery, or a shrub fence of shrubbery or, that might uh, define a property line or something like that. Um, forget the name of the comedian. Um, it's not important uh, to bring that. Uh, I can't remember his name. But anyway, he, he, used, he would speak about this. We pray about a hedge of protection around, for, around people as though uh, the devil, he's like, he, he's afraid of, of uh, horticulture. He's, he's afraid of, of greenery. He's like, oh, it's a bush. Like, I, I got to stay away from this person. It can keep you in and keep the others out. And keep you in and keep others out. Keep the hedge of God for the hedge of virtue. Mm hmm. You can keep you in there. And you also keep other people out that will do you harm. Right. Okay. So that's the way we think about it when we think of hedge in a biblical sense. But a hedge, does that necessarily keep people out? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, people can, they, they, they can jump over it and run through it. That not sort of. Not if it's high enough. Again. Not if it's high enough. Yeah, but then when it's clear, but when I travel, um, when I pray, I pray that Father Mm -hmm. So it's like asking the Lord to hold us in the arms of that thing. Okay. And it's always worked so far. I've traveled from the sea to the Jersey. There you go. This hedge about as with thorns. Anybody know the context or the why a hedging about with thorns? 
You do. Uh, when we were in Israel, we were traveling through the, the mountains of Judea. You would see numerous caves all along the, the landscape. And you would also see numerous pathways along the sides of those um, mountains. They're, they're more like very high hills, more than what you and I would consider the majestic mountains. And then it's desert. Yeah, no green. You're not seeing fields. So you're not seeing hedges there as, as such that you would think like that. Uh, but there would be lots of, of uh, thorn bushes that grow in that region. And there's lots of flocks. So you see flocks of sheep, flocks of goats, and the shepherds that would be leading them. And as we were driving and seeing this, our tour guide had mentioned to us that what the shepherds would do is that they would take their sheep at night when they're far away from, from home, their pasture, their home pasture, and home, away from their pens, and they would put their sheep inside of a cave. Then the, the shepherd would then go out and gather a hedgery of thorns and put it around the mouth of that cave and build it high so that wild animals wouldn't try to get over it because they, they, to go over it, they're going to expose the uh, sensitive parts of their stomach to these thorns. And then furthermore, that the shepherd would lay down across the doorway or the entrance of that cave. How does that apply here? Those who have a hedge to worthless idols, what does that mean? It would be this idea, all right, so if, if you've got something that you're considering valuable, precious, of great worth, although it's an idol, the picture here would be the clinging or hedging that what you consider to be valuable as with thorns so that nothing can come in and take it from you. Those who, claim, who, who hedge their idols about with thorns, those who cling to them, this idea, or this idea of worshiping, because if you are protecting or guarding, that's really what this idea is, right? You're protecting or guarding your idols. Why is it? Because you consider them something that you want to hang on to. That, what's that? That you value. To observe them to regard them. There's those who, who regard them or cling to them, these worthless idols. There's, there's another idea here, and the uh, English Standard Version speaks about um, those who forsake, excuse me, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still in the first. I'm looking for it here. I've got uh, mm -hmm. uh, to vain. That's what I was looking for. All right. So this idea of worthless or vain. All right. Um, what else do we have there for worthless or vain? Any other? We've got in, we've got King James as lying vanities. So vain things, um, empty. Here's this idea of worthless idols. In the Hebrew, the idea is this. The, the word is, let's uh, give a different color. Hevel. The word is hevel, and it literally means a vapor or a breath. So those 
who hang on to a vapor or a breath. Is it easy? Can you do that? Once it's, once it's exhaled, you're not getting it back in. This word hevel is the same word, it's, there's, there's a proper name to it. And the proper name is one of the first sons of Adam and Eve. Which one? Hevel. Hevel. Abel. Abel. His name means a vapor or a breath, and we even see that picture of he's not on the scene for very long. And Scripture then speaks about that throughout its record that our lives are like a vapor or a breath. So we're even those who live the longest, our lives are really something we're here, and then like a vapor, it's gone. You wonder where it went. Yeah. He's, he's talking here when he says these are clinging to worthless idols, those who, who cling or observe or regard breath or vapor as though it's something of substance or staying power. There's any, no, nothing lasting about it. The Scriptures tell us about uh, those who, who cling to idols, that they, they become like what they worship. I want us to go to this next, this next phrase. What do we come up with in this next phrase? No, no, we're still in Jonah uh, 6 and verse 8. What's that last phrase that you see there? They forfeit the grace that could be theirs. What else do we have? They forsake their own mercy. They forsake their own mercy. They turn their backs on all God's mercies. Turn their backs. So what translation is that? They turn their backs. The oh, that's the, uh, the living. Yeah. Okay. Turn their backs. On what? On all God's mercies. All God's mercies. Forsake hope of steadfast love. Pardon me? All right, so I want to look at a couple of things here. They, they forsake or they forfeit the grace. This word is the word hesed. It gets translated as loving kindness. Well, let's go to Psalm 144. Psalm 144, and I want us to look at verse 2. My goodness and my fortress, 
my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdues my people under me. So, uh, he's speaking about the Lord. So in verse 1 of that same chapter, Blessed be the Lord, my rock. And then he speaks of this of his rock in verse 2 as his, his fortress and his stronghold. What's before that? His, what is it? Lo my loving God. He's my loving God or my loving kindness. It's that word there, my loving God, is the word hesed. My loving God, my steadfast love. When it says in the, um, it's the NIV, and I think the ESV probably uh, says it as well, forfeit the great grace that could be theirs. There's only one place that that grace is found, and that's in God. And God Himself is our loving God, our steadfast love. That's why it's not just forsake their own mercy, lowercase m mercy, but it's forsake their capital M mercy, their own mercy. Speaking of their own God, their, their own source, of loving kindness, which is God Himself, the one who's given Himself to them. So see this picture. Those who try to hang on to a vapor, those things that are not God, are they're forsaking their own love. They're forsaking that which would be their own grace, the, their own provision, their own protection. The presence, protection, and the provision of God is they're, they're turning their backs on it. And here's, here's his, his attitude or his focus regarding this. I want to go to Psalm 107. And let's look at verses 20 to 25. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Others went out on the sea in ships, and they were merchants on the mighty water. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. Now there's a connection going on here with those who regard worthless idols are forsaking their own mercy, they're forsaking their own their their loving kindness, they're forsaking God. This means that they're missing out on that which could have been theirs. And we, we see a picture here of their they're missing out on the life that was being provided for them. In these particular verses in Psalm 107, there is what is referred to as the reversed noon. That doesn't mean a whole lot to you right off, but um, noon is one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It's equivalent uh, to our letter N. So if you picture a letter N, which is like this, an inverted N would be uh, like this, backwards, reversed. When you look at Hebrew scriptures, every time 
you see at noon, it's always like this. It's written that way. But in these particular verses, at the beginning of each verse, instead of like this, you have a noon that looks this way. At the beginning of each verse. You also see it in verse 40. And noon, that letter is a picture of a of a fish. The fish speaks of, of life, that which so this letter here speaks of life as it's represented by a fish in in old or ancient written Hebrew. It wouldn't look like this. It has an appearance as a fish, like a swiggle. And with this fish, it, it's a it's equated to the quickening or making alive, quickening of life. So normal noon, a regular noon, uh, means life. Then this backward noon has this idea of, of life from the dead or life that um, it's being infused with something more than just a regular life. This is used as something like a parenthesis today. This is where we get our brackets, our, our not a, uh, yeah, I guess bracketed parentheses. And it starts off, the only other place where you see it is in the book of Numbers, chapter 10. And it's a declaration that Moses makes, Numbers, chapter 10. We're looking here at verses 35 and 36. Uh, sure, please. Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, may your enemies be scattered, may your foes flee before me. Whenever it came to rest, he said, Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. So notice the context when Moses says this. Now keep in mind, this is where you have this reversed noon. So in other words, it's got this idea of focus here. Pay attention to this. Drawing, I'm drawing attention to this. It's only, remember, it only occurs here in Numbers chapter 10 and Psalm 107. In those number of verses, it occurs nine times in total. So when does he say this? When the ark set out and when the ark came back to rest, to its resting place. And notice what he says, rise up, O Lord. He's, he's really given a prophecy of, of Messiah's resurrection. Because the ark of the Lord, what does it represent? The presence of God. And it's the presence of God by virtue of what? The blood. What is it? The blood, pardon me, the blood on the mercy seat. So that blood on the mercy seat is the means by which the presence of God will be among His people. And we see in the New Testament how Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 tells us that God has made a way to Him through Jesus, who is the mercy seat or propitiation for us. It's the only other time that word is used, and you've heard me say this before, is Hebrews 9 and verse 5 where it says, and in the most holy place was the mercy seat, which is the same Greek word in Romans 3 and verse 25 when it says propitiation. The word there is literally mercy seat. So Jesus as our mercy seat, Him rise up, O Lord. Let your enemies be scattered. What did God do through Jesus Christ when He was raised up? He scattered His enemies. Is that not right? 
And, and he, he disarmed those powers and those principalities, and he made a public spectacle of them, and he triumphed over them in it. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to what? To the many thousands of Israel. In other words, to those who are going to come into your presence by virtue of what you have done, what your mercy seat represents and how you have led us through the wilderness, through the parched and dry places. You've brought us to the, to the place of abundance and provision because the resting place ultimately was where? In Jerusalem. Not to be uh, moved around anymore because in the, in the uh, wilderness, from time to time, they would break camp and they would be in Kadesh Barnea or they would be at Sinai, uh, different places along the way. And so here we have Jonah uh, as he's making a, a connection here to those things that, uh, that, his, that the life of God, the, the rabbis was uh, seeing... We don't have a, a noon, an inverted noon in Jonah chapter uh, 2, but the rabbis draw attention and focus that what he's uh, praying here is related to Psalm 107 and those verses 20 through 25. And so they draw a connection here of, the, of this noon, but they, of course, don't see the life uh, that's through Jesus Christ. They're just seeing the life that has been given back to Jonah because for a time he forsook God. He turned away and he clung to what? Running after his own pursuits, which turned out to be nothing but a vapor. So his own ideas, it can be as, as little as, or as much as, if you will, an idea. Because was Jonah carrying anything with him when he went running to Tarshish? He had some money to pay for his fare, and, but he wasn't, was he carrying idols in his pockets? He wasn't hanging on to them in his arms. What was he clinging to? To an idea that I don't want to be available to God. I want to be someplace where I cannot obey Him. So that it'll, it'll make it basically or virtually impossible for me to do anything in response to this commission that He's given to me. Because if he's 2,500 miles away, I mean, come on, God, how am I going to... Can't, can't do that. Or at least it's going to be delayed for at least... Remember what we saw, that if you got there, a travel round trip was going to take you approximately how long? About a year. Because of the trade winds, and you got to stop along the way, and so on. So here's where his shift changes, his focus. He says, but I will sacrifice to you. So he says, he's really saying this is the way I was. I was regarding worthless idols. I was holding on to this, these vapors, to this breath. And I was forsaking my loving kindness. I was forsaking the steadfast love of God. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. This, this word for thanksgiving is the word... Todah. And it means to extend a hand, to extend the hands. So he's, he's really saying that with the voice of thanksgiving, interesting voice is extending its hands, if you will. But with his voice, he's saying that I'm extending my hands and I'm giving thanksgiving to you and I will pay what I have vowed. In other words, I'm turning. This, this is a, a prayer of repentance. I want you to see this last phrase here. What does he say? How does his prayer end? Salvation comes from the Lord. I'm going to write this in the Hebrew, although it's not going to make uh, you're not going to be able to identify the letters so much. But remember last week I said the hey is important for us to recognize here. So we saw the um, the fish is dog. 
And on the end of that word was the letter hey. Do you remember what that hey represented? It speaks of revelation, so to reveal or to show. Now, here's this word salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, normally, um, you would have it end like this. But there's a difference that is coming on in the way that the author writes this. It's Yeshua Ta. So I'm going to stop right there. This, this is not the normal way that you would spell salvation in Hebrew. This is a variation in the Hebrew. Here's what it's saying. This part is Yeshua. So what is Yeshua? What is it? Jesus. This letter here is always represented by an X or a cross, use often sideways, but we're going to put a cross like this. And then the last letter, the He, remember what we saw it referred to? Revealed the cross of Jesus or Jesus is revealed through his cross, if you will. Salvation is of the Lord. He gets a picture of God in the belly of this fish. Even though he may not fully understand what he's saying, he's not, he's not a, a literally seeing Jesus, but inspiration of the Holy Spirit is bringing him to this point where we're seeing that there's a a unique way of spelling this word salvation in Hebrew, and here it is. And these are, in this variance, it's showing by the very picture of it that Jesus is revealed to us through his death and his resurrection. Because what is the very next thing that takes place in this passage? So the Lord speaks to the fish. It vomits him under dry land. What is, this is the picture then of the resurrection, as it were. Because in the fish, going into the, going into the sea, that's a picture of chaos, sin, which results in death. He goes into the fish. He goes into Sheol, the grave. And now we're seeing that he's being cast out of that grave. And a picture of Jesus, as though the the uh, the the grave could not stomach holding Jesus in. When I was trying to find an answer for what your questions were, mm -hmm. I was in King James Version, and I found um, Jonah 117. It's titled, Prepare the Great Fish to Swallow Up Jonah. And uh, it goes on to say, we were discussing a while, a couple of weeks ago, about a whale or a fish. And it says, a whale, our Savior calls it. Our Savior calls it a whale. One of the largest sorts of whales that have wider throats than others, in the belly of which has something been found. The dead body of a man in armor. It was of the Lord's mercies that Jonah was not consumed. Mm. Okay. In the King James? Yeah. Okay. Now, in the King James, it says whale, but in the original language, you won't see whale. It's still the fish, still fish. So um, it's translated as whale, but in the Greek, it's fish, 
in the Hebrew, pardon me. I'm sorry. It goes on to say, and the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out on the, upon the dry land. Right. So the Lord spoke to the fish. When it says, when Jesus speaks of Jonah, he doesn't say Jonah as, as he was in the belly of the whale. No. He says, now the King James might, does say whale, but uh, Jesus in Greek, he says the belly of the fish. Now he vomited Jonah, or it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Uh, the vomiting is the expelling or the releasing, if you will, from that which represented the grave. And I want you to see that in the Hebrew, in between the word Jonah and vomit, you have this word right here. You don't see it here. It's not translated. But this word is the Aleph and the Tav, which is the same in the Greek, which is, we've looked at this in the past, is like the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. So this is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Tav. The how do you say it, you mean? Yeah. Eight. It's, it, it's a, it's a, there, there's no, there's no translation. It's a, it's a modifier. So in the Hebrew, you would read it. <laughs> in the Hebrew, you would read it, you would see it there and you would read it and you would, you'd pronounce it, but it's, it's not translatable into English. There's no equivalent in English. But every time we see eight, this word Aleph Tav, in the English, uh, it's, it's always pointed to something regarding Jesus. It's always pointed to something that he's done or his character, his personality, his nature, um, experience. So, it, so Jonah was, Jonah, Aleph Tav, vomited. So it's like in this picture here is Jesus. Jesus is being represented by Jonah, uh, the symbol, if you will, and being vomited out really is his resurrection. Now when we think of vomit, we think of a very unpleasant experience, right? But when he says vomited, it literally means to spew or to spit to expel him out, to release, to release him. So we see a releasing of the one who is a sim symbol of Jesus. And in between those two words of releasing and Jonah, you have this modifier, Aleph Tav. And it's a picture here of Jesus who is being released from the grave. It's a picture of Jesus, his resurrection. Now, before we leave chapter 2, the, the idea of what's going on here, and before we go forward into chapter 3, we need to look at uh, something to hear back in chapter 1, the last verse, all right? Verse 17. So we have it mentioned for us at the beginning of Jonah's experience rather than at the end of his experience. You, what does it say here? Now, Jonah, now the Lord had prepared a great fish, a dog, and uh, to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now... You would almost think that at the end, so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah on a dry land and Jonah was in the fish three days and three nights. But he, the, that information is given to us in advance of the experience rather than at the end of the experience. So 
I want to bring our attention back to that because we, because of the chapters, we tend to confine things in their chapter. But verse 17 of chapter 1 is part of this, right? He was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And this is the picture that Jesus refers to expressly in Matthew chapter 12. When he says that as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. Uh, verse 38, I believe it is. Uh, 38, and then down to verse 42. But specifically, verse 40, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. And that was what you were referring to in that commentary that you uh, had mentioned, that Jesus said he was in the belly of the, in the King James, the whale. But literally, he was in the belly of the fish. Three days and three nights. I want us to realize that this picture of three is, is always pointed to Jesus, and it occurs a handful of times throughout the Scriptures. And the first time we see three in the Scripture is where? Uh, no. Good guess, though. What was this? Day three. So the word three. The word three. First time we see three in the scriptures is in Genesis, day three. It's verse uh, chapter one, verses nine to thirteen. The things that are being uh, that are taking place on day three. What occurs on day three? What does God do on day three? He creates. What is it? Good guess. <laughs> Good guess. Fish in the sea? Close, no. What is it? He's, he does a separation of the permanent and permanent and uh, water. Good guess. From the water and the land. So, no, no, there's a difference. In, in verse, in, in day two, he separates the sky, the firmament above and the firmament below, if you will. The waters above and the waters below, and the, the expanse in between he called sky. On the third day, he causes, he separates the water from dry land. So, in other words, he causes land to appear, and on the land, what happens? Vegetation. So, plants. So, what happens on day three? Another word for plants. The concept of it. What are plants doing? Growing. Life. Life. So, that's the first sign of life. Now, when you look at the days of creation, the first three days correspond to the second three days of creation. That is, on the first day, God creates the light. And what does He do on the fourth day? He creates the sun, the moon, and the stars on day four, which correspond to day one. So He creates the light on day one, on day four, he, he then designates or, or, or designates those light bodies or luminary bodies. On day two, he separates the sky above from the sky or firmament below, the waters above and the waters below. And what does he do on day five? He fills the, the waters below with fish and the sky above he fills with birds. Fowls or birds, yeah. And on the third day, he creates the land or makes land appear and fills it with plants. And on the sixth day, what does he make on the land? Animals and mankind. So 
3, the third day, you see this picture of life. And of course, that which corresponds to it on day 6 is the crown of creation, if you will. Uh, what is man that you would be mindful of him, the son of man that you would take notice of him? You created him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. So we have this picture of, of new life, the first sign of life on the third day. Then the next time we see a three is in Genesis chapter 22. That uh, Abraham was told to take his son Isaac to the place, the mountain that he would show him, and they traveled how many days? Three days. Three days. And what happened on the third day? They arrived at Moriah, and of course, what happens on Moriah? The, the gospel is acted out with Isaiah, or excuse me, Isaac. Say it again, Claire. Where he was uh, commanded to kill Isaac. Com commanded to kill Isaac. He stopped him. Yes, he stopped him from killing him. And essentially, he was raised from the dead. That's, and we have the substitute that was provided in the ram caught by its horns, its strength, in a thicket, a hedge of thorns, a thorn bush. Of course, picturing the curse, the crown on, on Jesus' head. And of course, Hebrews 11.19 says that, and by figure, he did receive, Abraham did receive Isaac back from the dead. That's where uh, Abraham come to the realization how God was going to bring salvation. Absolutely. Man through uh, the Son. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to look at uh, two more threes. One three is in Joshua chapter two. Joshua chapter 2. And I want to look at verse 15. Oh, excuse me, verse 16. Joshua 2 and verse 16. And who are we at for reading? Louise? And she said unto them, Get you to the mountains, let the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterwards may you go with them. We left the pursuers meet you. All right, so how long were they? To, did she advise they should hide? Three, three days. days. Three days. Now, I want, to, I want you to see something uh, interesting that takes place here. Book ending on either side of this. In verse 15, notice what happens. I'll draw our attention to it. She let these two men down by a cord or a rope for her house was on the city wall and she dwelt on the wall. Then look down at verse 18. Unless, so they're saying, all right, we will, we will save you um, and we, we will not attack you when, when we come back. Unless, so you, you will be saved unless when we come in, into you, your land, you bind this line. Um, or what's another word? This bi line of scarlet thread or cord or rope. So again, we have this picture of a rope or a cord. And which cord? It's the same one they, that she let them down by. So make sure you keep this, you have this cord, this rope in your window when we return. And if you do, then we will save you and your household alive as long as you are in the house. 
So we've got the cord in verse 15. She lets them down by, and they're saying, okay, now the sign that will mark you for salvation is this rope, this scarlet rope in your window. Now the thing is that the they use two different words here. And the word for rope in verse 15, it means cord or rope or measuring line. But it also means, I keep missing my, my words, it can also mean pain, sorrow, or travail. In verse 18, it also means cord or rope, but it also has the meaning of hope, expectation, thing longed for. It also means an outcome. What's in between verse 15 and verse 18? Three days. So the beginning of the three days, there's pain, there's sorrow, there's travail. After the three days is spoken about, there is hope or an expectation, the thing longed for that comes to pass. There's this picture there, this anticipation even foreshadowing Jesus in that. The last one is in the New Testament, in John chapter 2. John chapter 2 and verse 1. As you're turning there, does anybody know what event, main event, takes place at the very beginning of John chapter 2? What is it? You read it today? So what is it? What's, what's in John chapter 2, the first part of it? Water into wine. <laughs> Can't get credit for only thinking it. <laughs> no. Well, you know this. I go. I say it long. I want you to notice what it says in John two and verse one. On third day. Third day, and what does Jesus do? changes the water into wine. And what does that represent? The new covenant. It was by this that he demonstrated or he showed his glory to his disciples. What's his glory? His exaltation, his cross, him being lifted up. That's what John chapter 12 speaks about in a couple of different spots. If I be lifted up, speaks of, of his exaltation. And we see the connection of that in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, where um, there in John 2 it says there were water jars, pots for purification. The only other place that that word is used is in 1 John 1 and verse 7, that Jesus, He is the purification or the cleansing of our sins. And it's, of course, by virtue of the cross. And we have this picture. The last one then is coming back. To Jonah chapter 2, verse 17. He was in the belly of the fish seven day, or three days and three nights. Um, the interest, one last thing about that cord of, uh, of Rahab, when it says in verse 18 that there's a cord, uh, it's actually a cord of thread of scarlet. And at the beginning of that declaration is Aleph Tav. Jesus. The rope, the thread, if you will. That scarlet rope 